new paradigm means a new constellation of methodologies, terminologies, theories, and, uh, experimental results, and so on and so on. But here comes the interesting issue. The, actually, the key issue, uh, as I said at the beginning, of the so-called new philosophy of science. Do we have progress through, the, through revolutions? Can we actually say that our knowledge improved after a scientific revolution? Of course, the first uh, reaction, the norm, normal say, reaction to that would be yes. We abandoned the Ptolemaic Aristotelian, Ptolemaic astronomy, and we moved on into Copernican astronomy into Newtonian physics after the first scientific revolution. Or yes, we gave up old ideas about the nature of, uh, uh, of matter or the existence of so-called phlogiston and adopted a new theory advanced by Lavoisier uh, uh, dealing with oxygen and so on. Or else we abandoned the old Newtonian physics for the new picture offered by contemporary physics uh, based on theories such as Einstein's general theory of relativity or quantum physics. So the, um, so to say, the layman uh, answer to the question, was there any progress? The layman answer is obvious. Yes, of course. We abandon, we move from old points of view to new points of view. So we've made some progress. And Kuhn says, well, it's not really so simple. The question is way more complicated. Indeed, way more complicated. Indeed, what is the relationship between two successive paradigms? Say the Aristotelian uh, Ptolemaic paradigm in astronomy and which is Kuhn's classical example and uh, Copernican slash uh, Newtonian uh, astronomy or physics after the 17th century. Can we really compare these two paradigms? Can we really say that one is better than the other? Can we really say that uh, there was an improvement in our understanding of nature by shifting from one paradigm to the other? The answer is no, according to Kuhn. We cannot really say that because the relationship between two successive paradigms is a relation of so-called incommensurability. Incommensurability, this key term introduced by both Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolutions and Paul Feyerabend in that paper I mentioned earlier, Explanation, Reduction and Empiricism, both published, both works published in 1962 at a time in which both Feyerabend and Kuhn were colleagues at the University of Department of Philosophy of the University of Berkeley. So of course they knew each other, they talked to one another, but they independently uh, introduced the term in, in their works. So of course they were discussing these issues, possibly they were talking about this issue, uh, for sure they were talking about these issues, but the introduction was independent from them. Anyway, what is this incommensurability thesis? This uh, controversial, relationship between two successive paradigms. Well, as you know, uh, uh, two uh, uh, lengths in geometry are said to be incommensurable, hmm, such as, for example, the length of the uh, side of a, of, a, of a square and the length of its diagonal. Uh, these two lengths are incommensurable with one another, meaning that there is no uh, common unit of measure, uh, entire units of which may be used, uh, whole units of which may be used to measure both the diagonal of a square and its side. Anyway, this is a, a geometrical term. The, the idea comes to Kuhn from geometry, but has a uh, so to say, new reading in Kuhn's uh, picture. Uh, the idea is that two successive paradigms cannot be compared, fully compared at least, with one another. So much so 
that we cannot really say whether the next paradigm is actually a progress uh, uh, on the or a development on the previous paradigm. And there are actually, uh, so there are difficulties in comparing the two paradigms. And why are there these difficulties? Uh, these difficulties are of three kinds, Kuhn says. First of all, there is a methodological aspect of incommensurability. Uh, two paradigms cannot be compared from the methodological point of view. Uh, because each paradigm, as a Wittgensteinian language game, has its own problems or puzzles and its own way of deeming what a plausible or a viable solution to that puzzle is. To make a very simple but very clear example, in, a, in antiquity, uh, sailors asked, uh, why, why is the sea rough? What is the cause of the roughness of the sea? Uh, why is the sea stormy and so on? Why are, are we getting problems with our navigation? And the answer to that was, uh, well, the king of the sea, the, the, sorry, the god of the sea, Poseidon, is angry with us or is angry with uh, Ulysses, for example. So he's causing problems uh, to him. He's preventing Ulysses uh, from getting back to his island, Italy. And this was, at the time, a perfectly reasonable or scientific, uh, if you allow me to say, uh, explanation for the roughness of the sea. So, but that was a perfectly acceptable answer to the question, why is the sea rough? Nowadays, uh, thousands of years after that, that answer is no longer a, an acceptable answer. So the standards by which problems or puzzle are assessed in a given paradigm and the uh, standards by which a possible solution to that puzzle is deemed a satisfactory solution varies from paradigm to paradigm. This is the methodological aspect of incommensurability. Standards of problem evaluation of solution assessment changes change from paradigm to paradigm. So we cannot compare the puzzle or the problems. We cannot compare the solutions. First aspect of incommensurability, or at least we cannot fully compare. Huh? But this word fully is has a number of issues about it. But let's say uh, we cannot fully compare uh, these two uh, methodologies mm -hmm. or these two paradigms from the methodological point of view. Second, there is a um, there is a um, on, uh, what Kuhn calls a metaphysical or ontological aspect of incommensurability. And here I, I'll, I'll read what Kuhn says. When paradigms change, the world itself changes with them. That's why he uses this term ontology or metaphysics. Led by a new paradigm, scientists adopt new instruments and look in new places. Even more important, during revolutions, scientists see new and different things when looking with familiar instruments in places they have looked before. It is rather as if the professional community had been suddenly transported to another planet, where familiar objects are seen in a different light and are joined by unfamiliar ones as well. Of course, nothing of quite that sort does occur. There is no geographical transplantation. Nevertheless, paradigm changes do cause scientists to see the world of their research engagement differently. Insofar as their only recourse to that world is through what they see and do, we may want to say that after a revolution, scientists are responding to a different world.
Let me give you an example of that, of this ontological, so-called, or metaphysical uh, aspect of incommensurability. Uh, often, since revolutions, as I said, took maybe a century, or more than a century uh, to, to take place. So upholders or supporters of different paradigms never meet with one another. Right? We talk about pre-Einsteinian uh, physics, but we cannot actually talk to a pre-Einsteinian, to someone in the 18th century or the 19th century. They are all dead now, so there is no actual uh, exchange between us now and then, or them and ancient Greeks or whatever. So people support, uh, support in two different paradigms, usually different, different time periods and never actually talk to one another. Well, Norwood Russell Hanson, one of the uh, key, uh, the chief protagonists of the so-called new philosophy of science, whose book, uh, Patterns of Discovery, I mentioned at the very beginning, and was published in 1958, uh, offers in that very book a very interesting example of uh, this kind of uh, um, ontological incommensurability uh, between two successive paradigms. And here he says, imagine Tycho Brahe, the famous Danish astronomer, and Johannes Kepler uh, on looking, observing the sky or looking at the sky one night on a hill in Prague. Um, indeed, this is, an this is an interesting example because Kepler and Tycho actually lived in Prague for almost an, well, it's approximately one year between 1600 and 1601 before Tycho uh, suddenly died in 1601. Kepler was hired by Tycho as his assistant at the time. And so they spent some time together um, and they worked together uh, from time to time. They were not on really good terms. So the interaction was not very smooth, but they, they worked for, for some time together. And Tycho was upholding a, uh, was convinced that the true structure of the universe was neither Ptolemaic nor Copernican. Uh, it was he was upholding a, what, what is usually referred to as a Tychonic system, after his name Tycho Brahe, a uh, Tychonic system that saw the Earth at the center of the universe, the Moon circling or orbiting around the Earth, the Sun was a planet, still a planet, like like in Ptolemy's uh, picture, uh, revolving around the Earth, but all other planets. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were actually orbiting the sun. So it was his, this Tychonic system was a kind of uh, compromise between Copernicus and Ptolemy. Well, uh, on the other hand, Kepler was a, uh, a Copernican astronomer. He was taught Copernican astronomy by his own uh, master, uh, his own teacher in Tübingen, uh, Michael Meslin, uh, who was a Copernican. And so, Copernican, uh, so Kepler was a Copernican from the very beginning. So Hanson says, think of a, a dialogue between these two people on a, on a hill on Prague uh, one night during the time they spent together. They were both looking at the sky, at the sky. both were looking possibly at, uh, maybe they were at sunset, so they were looking at the sun. And uh, one saw, so the impressions on their retinas was exactly the same. Uh, what they actually, they were looking at, it was exactly the same object, namely the sun. Yet what Tycho saw was a sun, it was not at the center of the universe. He saw something that was rotating around the Earth. It was a planet. Whereas Kepler, by looking at the same object, was ahead of the uh, of Tycho, so to say, in the, in the revolution. And so he was looking at a sun, not as a planet, but as a uh, celestial body at the center of the universe at rest at the center of the universe. So they were looking at the same thing, but they um, 
they were actually seeing two different things. They were uh, acquiring the same data, the same rays of light hit their retinas, and still they were reacting to those very objects, to the very light in two very different ways. This is an example of ontological incommensurability. Mm -hmm. uh, another example who says shifts of this sort, uh, he described in the pages, uh, in these pages in chapter 10, uh, chapter 11 actually of the uh, structure of scientific revolution. Uh, shifts of this sort are not restricted to astronomy. We have already remarked some of the similar transformation of vision that can be drawn from the history of chemistry. Lavoisier, we said, saw oxygen where Priestley had seen dephlogisticated air and when, where others had seen nothing at all. In learning to see oxygen, however, Lavoisier also had to change his, many, his view of many other more familiar substances. He had, for example, to see a compound ore where Priestley and his contemporaries had seen elementary earth. And there were other such changes besides that. At the very least, as a result of, a discovering, of discovering oxygen, Lavoisier saw nature different. And in the absence of some recourse to that hypothetical fixed nature that he saw differently, the principle of economy will urge us to say that after discovering oxygen, Lavoisier worked in a different world. Mm -hmm. uh, the same goes for the time of Galileo, for example, uh, where Galileo saw a pendulum, people before him saw simply body following with a uh, restriction mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. There are many examples. People looking at the same phenomena, looking at the same uh, experiments in a sense, but actually reacting to different things. And this is the ontological aspect of the incommensurability relationship between two successive paradigms. The third and possibly uh, more lasting, uh, more significant aspect, even though I would say the, uh, the, the, the first two were actually equally important, but later on Kuhn actually uh, only focused on this third aspect of incommensurability, uh, the third aspect is the semantic aspect of incommensurability. Um, successive paradigms employ the same languages, the same terminology, but the terms actually acquire different meanings. So when Copernicus is talking about planets, he's not referring to the same things as uh, Ptolemy. Uh, if we have to come up with a classif with a, uh, a number of boxes or categories in which we put different objects in Copernican astronomy in the box with the label planets, we put, according to Copernicus, Mercury, Venus, Mars, but also Earth, the Earth. The Earth is, according to Copernicus, a planet. Whereas in, in the Ptolemaic, paradigm, the same box with the label planet includes the sun, which is not in the Copernicus uh, box, uh, includes the moon, which is not in the Copernicus box, because the moon after Copernicus becomes a satellite, no longer a, a planet, and so on. Before and after Einstein, as you well know, uh, the, the, the uh, scientists kept employing the very same term space and time. But of course, they meant to refer to very different things. Uh, Newton's idea of time and space is very, very different from Einstein's idea of time and space or space time, as he would say, and so on and so forth. Another uh, aspect uh, related to incommensurability, if not, uh, it's not really incommensurability, but it's related to the difficulty in um, uh, comparing successive paradigms is the phenomenon of so-called Kuhn, 
Kuhnian or Kuhn's loss. What is this loss? A, in the shift from one paradigm to another, some phenomena which are accounted for in the old paradigm are not accounted for in the new paradigm. There is a loss in the explanatory power of a given paradigm. Uh, some, uh, as we said, as we saw, some problems are no longer regarded as problems. And some phenomena are simply not explained in the new picture. Whereas according to Popper, we, uh, the best, uh, the best uh, outcome for a theory is to be included in a successive theory, in a theory that replaces it as a particular case in that theory. So the scope of the new theory is simply larger than the older theory. So it includes the old theories and covers a wider uh, set of phenomena. In Kuhn's, from Kuhn's point of view, uh, the, a new theory is not actually a particular case of the old one, it's a different thing. There may be some overlap in the, num in the, in the number of phenomena that are accounted for in different ways by the two paradigms, mm -hmm. but there are new phenomena uh, explained or accounted for in the new uh, paradigm, which were not even considered by the old paradigm, and there are phenomena accounted for or explained in the new paradigm that are not explained and accounted for in the new one. Mm. So this is actually the picture uh, in its broad lines of uh, uh, Kuhn's model for the growth of science. Mm -hmm.